Thanks be to God indeed for His amazing grace, His comfort in times when we need it the most, especially when we experience grief in life. That's the topic for this morning's message as we continue again in our sermon series, Faith That Overcomes. I don't know if you've heard of David Kessler, but when he was about 13 years old, he and his father had to go to the city to the hospital because his mother was gravely ill. Now at the time, um, much like, you know, today, uh, there were a lot of restrictions on who could visit, what visitation times could take place, and so David's father could only visit for five minutes every so often throughout the day, just five minutes. And the nurse that was in charge was very strict about that time frame. And David was only 13. And the rule at that time was that you had to be 14 in order to go and visit somebody in the hospital. It was a heartbreaking situation because David couldn't be with his mother who was slowly slipping away. His dad was poor, and they couldn't stay in the room with her, and they couldn't stay in a hotel, so they slept in the hotel or the, the uh, hospital lobby for a while, and then they discovered a hotel that was just across the street, so to pass the time, they would go over to the hotel and, and hang out in the lobby and then go back to the hospital whenever they could. And Of course, David couldn't go, but his dad did. And as his mother's life slowly faded, um, this was 1972, by the way, uh, there was a fire in the hotel on the 18th floor. And all of a sudden, not only was there a fire on the 18th floor of this hotel, but shots began to ring out from the upper levels of the hotel, and people were being shot out on the street. It was actually one of the first mass shooting incidents in our country. So there was David and his father, helpless and hopeless. And now this other tragedy was on top of them. This shooter, and they feared for their lives. Well, um, the police took care of the situation. It turned out that it was a template for everything about what not to do in a mass shooting situation. And so David was not only grieving the loss of his mother and the trauma of this shooting situation, but on the way home, the pilot thought it would be a good idea, since it was David's first airplane flight, to bring him up in the cockpit and let him fly the plane. Now you'd think, wow, that's pretty cool. You get the young kid, 13 years old, you're going to fly the plane? But the pilot said something that really disturbed David. And what he said was, Now be careful, son, because you've got 148 lives in your hands. The pressure of losing his mother and not being able to be with her, the trauma of the shooting, and now this good-intentioned airline pilot who lets David fly the plane just heaped on the grief and the hurt and the sorrow and the, and the sadness that David was feeling, the responsibility and all the turmoil of emotions that he was going through at a, such a young age. It was event, a series of events that dramatically shaped his life forever. In fact, David would go on to help with the Los Angeles Police Department, the Sheriff's Department, as someone who helped with victims of trauma. He went on to be a therapist and a counselor to help people process grief. He went on to be an author. In fact, I bet you know this name as we talk about grief, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Kubler-Ross. We've all heard of her, right? In the 1970s, she came up with this design. Uh, It was actually... Um, uh, the stages of a person dying. 
But throughout time, what happened was that they, those stages became distorted, and they became stages that we now apply to the grief process. And David Kessler was a colleague of Elizabeth Ross's and helped her to formulate this stages of dying and that helped her to write some of her books. They were very, very good friends. Well, we all know those five stages, right? That, that process that, of grief. The problem is that those, those five stages, and I'll talk about them in a minute, have become codified. In other words, they've become a template and an ABC kind of formulaic um, process in which we're supposed to go through in order to get over the losses in our lives. The problem is, uh, well, there's a couple problems with that. First, it was never meant to be that way. First of all, it was meant to be a process of, that was fluid. You might go through one feeling and emotion, and then you might go through another, and then back up to something else, but it wasn't Dot, 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 one, two, three, four, five. It was never meant to be uh, uh, the final say about our grief, a, a sense of finality, a sense of closure. That wasn't what these two authors were attempting to do, Ross and Kessler. They were attempting to help us to process those important losses in our lives, but what happened was those became distorted. Now, you know those five. I bet some of you could say them by name, but here they are for those of you who need the reminder. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. You know, how many times have we had a loss in our lives and it's been so shocking that it's hard for us to accept. It's almost like our brain shuts off and, and we can't think straight and we just sort of block it out. That's that denial phase that we sometimes go through. Then there's the anger phase. I've, I've been with people who are angry that a loved one has left them and died and passed away. Why did you do this? Why have you left me? What am I going to do now? They're, they're just heartbroken and in their grief they're angry at the one who has left them behind and passed away. It doesn't have to make sense, but that's what happens in our emotions. And then there's that bargaining. Now, I don't know what kind of grief uh, you've experienced in life, but I've been with people who have had to make those life and death decisions. You know that their loved one is, is on the machines, on the ventilator, they're filled with medications to keep them alive and the doctor comes in and says, I really can't do much more than what we're doing right now. We can keep them comfortable, but, but it's not looking good. And they have to make that hard decision. And then after they make that decision, based on talking with their family and their loved ones and, and what the doctors are saying and maybe what the pastor's input is, they've got to make that hard decision. And the whole time leading up to it, they're, they're questioning. Was there something more I could have done? Did I do the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? What would they want? And they're weighing and struggling those questions of what if as we bargain in the face of our grief and in our loss. Then there's that depression phase that sits in that, I've, I've heard somebody say it's the sad Today, the sad is here. It's that weight that kind of overtakes us in our heartbrokenness. It's that weight that we cry and, and we miss the person that's passed. And then there's acceptance. We finally come to that point in which there's the acceptance of the loss and the grief and We've moved on to a point. But let me emphasize once again that these aren't a linear set of stages, one, two, three, four, five. No, they aren't meant to be that way. Maybe you wake up one day and you're just the sad is there. And then you find yourself getting angry. 
And then you just can't believe they're gone. What am I going to do? What? I miss them so much. And then maybe it's the next day you've accepted it and worked through it, and it just keeps going around and around. You see, we really never get that closure that we seek, but life continues on. And with time, our pain is replaced with the love that we've had for that one that we've lost. Love replaces our pain. The love that drives those tears. The love that drives our feelings and emotions. The memories of how that person touched our lives and shaped us to who we are. You know, I, I, I mentioned that Jerry Ford had passed away. Most of you knew that already. And, you know, I... I always think that in a time of great loss, it's not about the words I say, it's not about necessarily the shape of the funeral service, but when I approach those situations, I always want to try to start the healing process. I want to uh, do a service that honors their memory, but the Ford family decided not to, to do a, a traditional service. Instead, they decided to honor Jerry's life and memories with stories that you all have shared and, and how you knew Jerry and how Jerry touched your life and how Jerry touched so many other lives in our community. What an amazing tribute. And I know that hearing the stories and the feedback, they've been tremendously blessed. Things they've learned that they never knew about Jerry. Phyllis, married all that time, never knew some of the things in the letters that have been shared. You see, we never really get over it, but we learn to live with our grief. We learn to live with the sadness. We learn to live with um, our, our, our emotions and the loss. You know, sometimes, though, sadly, for all, all of us, Paul writes it that we're, we're comforted by God so that we can bring comfort to others. But sometimes, I think part of the problem in, in the whole grief process for us is that when we experience grief either close to us or in a friend's life or, or some, somebody who we know, we simply don't know what to say, do we? We find it difficult to find the words. In fact, I'd I was with Kyle when he passed away on Thursday night. Now, I've been with many people in many situations in the hospital, but it was difficult to find words for me to bring comfort. Most of the time, honestly, I say as few words as I can. And you might think that that's not the appropriate thing. Maybe I'm supposed to give them assurance or... And I try to do that. I try to bring comfort. But sometimes our words get in the way because the grief and the loss and the sadness makes us feel uncomfortable when we're in those situations. You see, we want people to just get over their grief, don't we? If we're honest with ourselves. We'll say, I'm there for you if you need anything. But that feeling, those intense feelings of loss, just baffle us a lot of the time. We either don't know what to say, we say the wrong thing, or we just want people to get over it. You've grieved long enough, but there's no timeline for grief. There isn't, you should grieve for a year, you should grieve for six months, you should grieve this amount of time. And then you should just move on and forget about it. You can't forget about it. That's somebody that you've loved. that shaped your life. That's been a part of your life. It hurts. It hurts. It's meant not to just go away. Now, why did I start with this guy, David Kessler? Because David Kessler gives us a new way to look at our grief and our loss in life. And by the way... Grief can come in losing one we love, but it can come from divorce. It can come from a relational breakup. It can come from losing our job, a betrayal of the trust where trust dies. 
a career, retirement, the loss of driving privileges, the COVID-19 virus. Man, people are isolated now in nursing homes and struggling with depression. In fact, people are passing away from their dementia and Alzheimer's because of the loneliness. We've lost our freedoms during this time too, haven't we? So David Kessler, in processing his life and his grief and, and what he's learned throughout as he's lectured and taught uh, workshops and written books on the process of grief, he says, look, eventually you got to go, at some point you may go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, but he added a sixth stage, and this is what it is. You got to come to a point where it has meaning has meaning now David says it's not meaning as well why did this person die we all know that death is an inevitable part of life right I mean it's like taxes death and taxes it's gonna happen so it's not why did this person pass away or why did I lose this job or why did my spouse leave me or why did they this person betray me uh, but it's a sense of meaning in the memories, like Jerry, the letters, the cards, the Facebook posts. There is no meaning in death itself, and there is no meaning in a, a tragedy such as murder or a, another type of tragedy. But meaning comes from what we do after we've, we've lost somebody in our lives. How those memories continue to live on in our hearts. And he points out something that's really unique and, and, and powerful. While we try to avoid those intense feelings and, and maybe even kind of sh push people away that are grieving intensely, um, one of the most important parts of the process of healing is, and that we all want, is that our grief is witnessed. That somebody come alongside of us and help us get through the pain we know that God is on our side that God brings us comfort that God's grace is sufficient that God's power is sufficient we hold on to the promises of Jesus but we need somebody to come alongside of us to witness our pain our hurt our heartache as David traveled the world and did workshops and so forth he heard a story about he was in Australia and he was talking to a colleague of his a doctor who was also in the field of grief and processing all this. And he said, you know, in our country, the aboriginal people have a, a unique custom on how they come together in community to witness someone's grief. He says, after a loss, what happens is everybody in the village moves something in their house or in their yard. They simply move it from one place to another. And it's a symbolic act uh, for those who ex are experienced the loss in their lives that everything now is different. We have to have those witnesses in our lives that help us to understand and process and realize that everything's different. We can't just push people away. We need to find meaning in the lives of those we love. You see, our job is to honor our own grief, and hopefully we feel that comfort from God surrounding us. We hold on to the promises of Jesus Christ, and we have folks that come beside us and help us. Because it's our job to process our own grief because no one else can understand it. We're to stay in love with those people and things that we've lost in life. We're to seek meaning of our losses so that we can heal with God's help. That's how we get to a place where grief no longer overwhelms us, but simply helps us to carry on and to move on. I'll end with the story that David shares. He was lecturing around the world and he found himself in Hamburg, Germany. I don't know if you've ever been to Hamburg, Germany. I, I was stationed in Germany for a time, but I don't think I ever made it to Hamburg. 
Well, anyway, he said that as he got there, he realized that what a beautiful city it was. There was these just fabulous buildings all around, and it just seemed so different from other places. Well, if you know your history, then you know that Hamburg was a pretty important uh, city in World War II. The British and American troops bombed Hamburg repeatedly. And so, as he was touring around the city and seeing all these beautiful buildings and realizing the history, another colleague of his says, well, you've got to come to the chapel of St. Nicholas. You have to see it. You have to see this, this chapel. And so I'm sure that David thought to himself, well, it must be a beautiful cathedral that uh, just is going to be overwhelming. But when he got there in the middle of the city, surrounded by all these beautiful buildings, was the rubble of what used to be St. Nicholas Cathedral, her chapel. What a powerful metaphor for our own losses, right? The Allied troops had built that beautiful city, but yet in the middle was that memorial to the losses that were experienced by those people in that city. That's kind of like our grief. It never really goes away. We just live with it. We remember. We love. But all around it, we can build a beautiful structure and carry on throughout our lives with meaning and purpose. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we live in a difficult time. There's so many people grieving, so many people that are overwhelmed with loneliness, so many losses from financial and economic losses, people losing their businesses and their dreams and their livelihood, to people losing loved ones in their hands are tied because they can't go visit like they would want to or the funeral service is limited to sex amount of people and there's that unresolved kind of feelings and sadness that kind of overwhelms us but as Paul wrote to his to the church at Corinth we know that you provide our comfort that through your power through your grace your grace is sufficient for us to get through the trials and the tribulations we face in life so heal us Lord heal our grief and our sorrow help us to turn to you for the answers and the solutions so that life can have meaning and purpose despite the trials the struggles and the suffering in Jesus name Amen <laughs>